this is one of my core approaches or philosophies to life, which is you should create your life rather than live it. Everything from the relationships you build to the home that you live in to the way that you structure your normal day, like all of that can be a work of art. You're clearly an entrepreneur. You, you clearly have a, a pretty, you know, big business here um, that seems to be uh, like still almost early stage, mm. you know, for the potential of it all. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you, you got there through writing, yeah. right? And so I'm kind of curious about like the steps that were happening when you when you graduate from college. You decide that you're not going to play professional baseball. Yeah, that's not in the cards. You know, then what happens? Yeah, yeah, that was kind of decided for me. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so there. Um, there's some interesting steps kind of along the way. So the first is I mentioned, you know, Hey, I really liked school. I was kind of into that. And then sometime around college, I started getting this like entrepreneurial bug more where I was like, Hey, I, you know, I didn't, I actually didn't even know this until myself about maybe a year or two ago, but ultimately what I really love is creating things. Mm. Um, maybe that's sometimes it's a business. Sometimes it's a book. Maybe it's designing a new house, maybe, whatever the project is. I really like the act of creating something from nothing. And I did not know that about myself until recently, but that has been a core theme or personality trait of mine for a long time. So when I went to college, I looked at all the, the majors and they were fine, but like none of them really stuck out to me. And eventually I found out that you could design your own major at Denison. And so I was like, oh, well, I'll do that. So I just looked through the course catalog, picked all the classes that I wanted to take laid them all out on a piece of paper. And then I said, okay, what would you call this major if you put all these classes together? And um, it turns out biomechanics was what I ended up calling it. It was like mostly biology and some anatomy classes. And there was like one or two physics thrown in there. And so it was, I liked the sciences at the time and that was what I wanted to take. So I just threw it all out there and then I sent it to the academic affairs council and they said, yeah, okay, that could be your major. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that at the time, but looking back now, you're like, oh, that's kind of a fairly entrepreneurial thing to do. You yeah. look at the set of options, you say, I don't really like any of these. I'm going to create my own. Mm -hmm. So that happened. Then uh, I started doing some other things like after each semester, I would go up and down the halls in the dorm and I would ask anybody, I would say, hey, you want me to sell your textbooks for you? Like your, your old textbooks from last semester. And everybody's like, yeah, okay, sure. I was like, all right, I'll just sell them and I'll split the money with you. And they're like, all right, that's fine. So on my end, I was getting free inventory, right? I didn't have to pay anything for the cost of goods. And then I would go on Amazon and because it was free to me, I would just list it at, I would just undercut the price on every textbook. So I'm mm -hmm. just listed for the cheapest amount possible. And it was all just free profit. And then I split it with all my friends. And then, mm -hmm. so that was actually, I wouldn't call that a business, but that was like my first business or entrepreneurial thing. Sure. Yeah. So I did that. And then I graduated and I went to Ohio state. Um, while I was there, I was studying, uh, I was, I mean, I was getting my MBA, but my, what do they call it? Graduate assistantship my job on campus was to work in the center for entrepreneurship and study venture capital investment in the Midwest. So I did that and I was seeing, I was kind of analyzing all these companies that were getting funded. And I was like, you know, all these people are starting their own business. Like maybe I could start my own thing. And so as I was like looking at all these people doing these startups for a year or two, I was, that was when I was like, you know what, maybe I should just try to do this. Like I'm not really excited about getting a corporate job or doing what all the other people in the MBA class are doing. Like maybe I should try my own thing. Mm -hmm. And the only problem was I didn't have any money. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, my, um, my MBA program sent out this email and they said, Hey, there's this conference in Switzerland. It's called the St. Gallen symposium. And if you apply to the conference you have to submit an essay. And if your essay is selected, they will fly you to Switzerland. And I had never been abroad. And so I thought, well, that sounds cool. I'd like to go abroad like that. That would be fun. So I submitted uh, an essay and I got to go to the conference the first year. My second year, my last year of the MBA, I submitted an essay again. And this time I ended up winning. And the top prize for winning that essay competition was $10,000. And so I went to Switzerland in May. I graduated in June. And I had 10 grand in my bank account. So I was like, all right, so this is the money I'm going to live off of and use to start, uh, to start my business. And so it took me, I, I lived off of that for a few months. Then I moved back into my parents' house. I lived there for, I think, 11 months. And then, so it was probably about 18 months in to the entrepreneurial journey that I was able to move out on my own and get my own apartment and like had enough money coming in. Mm -hmm. And those first two years of entrepreneurship were very, 
you know, I think every entrepreneur has some version of this story. Really gritty. You're not making any money. Um, you have no respect or credibility. You don't really know what you're doing. There are a lot of one-time costs that have to be paid. Like I didn't know how to build a website, so I had to mm-hmm. teach myself that skill. And then I didn't know how to set up an email list, so I had to do that. And then, I, you know, all these things you got to do for the first time. And then on top of all those first time things that you're doing, you have to do the actual business that you're trying to build. Yeah. So I tried a bunch of different websites early on, probably four or five different ones. Um, I had one, uh, one idea where I bought puppypresent.com and I thought, well, my girlfriend likes playing with puppies. So what if I create this marketplace where you go to breeders and you say, Hey, you guys got all these puppies you haven't sold yet. What if you could rent out an hour for people to come play with them? And so then, you know, like you guys take a cut, I'll take a cut, whatever. And I thought it was a smart idea, but the breeders hated it. They were like, you just want to come play with the dogs, but you don't want to buy them. And I was yeah. like, yes, exactly. And they're like, absolutely not. Right. So I had a bunch of bad ideas like yeah. that. Um, I had an iPhone app. I, so remember I had that 10 grand yeah. and I paid, I used 1500 bucks of it to get an iPhone app designed, put it up on the app store. I think to this day, it made a grand total of like $17. So that was a bad, <laughs> that was a bad trade. Um, So I I tried a bunch of things Mm -hmm. and a lot of them didn't work out. And then I was taking some freelance clients on the side just to kind of make ends meet. And then eventually uh, I started jamesclear.com. So November 12th, 2012, that was the first post on, on jamesclear.com. Okay. And and I want to talk about why, you know, you, you started that, but just to back up on some of those other entrepreneurial uh, journeys, because I think you're right. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting thing. You know, a lot of times you do really need to throw a bunch up against the wall and see what sticks. And, uh, sometimes it hits right away. Sometimes it never hits. Mm -hmm. Right. But, um, I'm kind of curious just to learn a little bit more about like what was underneath the desire to be creating in, in the business world. Uh You know, I I don't know what your parents did or kind of, um, what, uh, was what else kind of drove you into business to begin with? Yeah. And, and what was it, you know, I know you saw the VC, you know, I don't know if it was just sort of the energy, the money, the, you know, um, the, the sizzle of it all, but like, what, why, why were you, uh, trying to create in that way? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I wasn't really engaged with the sizzle of it all or the funding. I, I have never had a venture funded company. I don't, I don't have anything against it, but it's just not my style. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a bootstrapping entrepreneur. Um, I did not have any entrepreneurs in my family. So my dad worked in insurance for 40 years. My mom, um, had a first career as a nurse and then her second career for the last like 15 years or so is as a, an assistant in a kindergarten classroom. So I didn't have anybody to look to as either an author or an entrepreneur. Um, I didn't have any close friends who were building businesses. So the thing that pulled me in was I was reading some blogs around that time that they were starting to make their full-time income from it. And I was like, wow, all these people do is they write a blog and then they can like travel where they want. That was something that was really important to me in my twenties. I really wanted to be able to travel and get out and see the world because I hadn't done that before. Um, they have flexibility. They can write about like what they want to write about. They get to like pick the projects that they focus on. You know, I had an internship between my first and second year of my MBA program and it was at an orthopedic practice. And for a long time I thought, Hey, maybe I'll go to medical school and do that. And it was, so it was a good fit for my interests, but I felt very underutilized there. I would go, I'd show up at work each day, and then I would only be asked to do this very narrowly defined set of tasks. And if it wasn't inside of that narrowly defined role, I wasn't asked to contribute. And I would go home and I just thought, man, you know, like, I feel like I have so much more to give Mm -hmm. and I'm just not being asked to do any of this stuff. Like I have so much creative energy right now. I have so much I want to um, contribute. And it was like, well, that's not your job. And so entrepreneurship is like the exact opposite of that. You know, you have to be CEO and janitor and everything Mm -hmm. in between. And, um, and I really liked that part of it. So, um, anyway, I didn't have anybody to look to, but I did have the strong desire to have control of my time and, um, to feel fully utilized, to feel like I could like give my best effort towards something and like make it my own. And again, like I just said a minute ago, I did not know this about myself at the time, but I really enjoy the act of creating things, of creating something from nothing. And so that, that energy was inside of me at that time, um, even though I couldn't have described it to you. But what I really wanted was to like make my own thing and build something that I could feel proud of. And so I think all of that was the primary driver behind it. Mm. 
Yeah, I, I guess I'm going to just uh, ask this question now because it's come up a couple of times just as I've been listening to you talk and mm -hmm. you talking about the act of creating, which is a which is a real passion of mine and and really you know it gets into my worldviews and beliefs in general and you know I'm not uh, entirely sure how I feel about this but I do tend to believe that we're all born to be creating. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what I think of when I think of atomic habits, what was like a real, like, aha for me is that it's, it's sort of designing your life that you're creating your life, right? That creativity yeah. as I was, uh, a kid was really focused on the fine arts, mm -hmm. right? You were an artist. If you were creative, mm -hmm. you know, maybe you were a musician, but creating your life to be what you want it to be, creating the experiences that you want to have, the relationships you want to have, your mindset, yep. you know, that is all an act of, of creativity. And, and, and I wonder what you think, but I think we're all meant to be that, that we come from that. That's who we are, that it's about being this creative source of energy that somehow gets lost along the way. And I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Piece. I mean, you're striking a deep chord with me right now. You know, I think um, this is one of my core approaches or philosophies to life, which is you should create your life rather than live it. Mm -hmm. And all of that can be a creative act. Every, everything from the relationships you build to the home that you live in, to the way that you structure your normal day, like all of that can be a work of art in a sense. Yeah. And it's definitely not just a painter or a sculptor or a musician who is an, a creative force. Um, in some ways, I almost think this is like the greatest thing that a human can provide. You can be this creative force that can call forth something that didn't exist before. You can design or structure or create or build something that didn't exist. And that is such a powerful ability. Um, and so I love that act of, mm -hmm. of doing that. Um, it, the other thing is if you broaden your definition of what is creative, then it starts to make life more fun. I think mm. you realize that there, like, there aren't really any rules. Um, and like one of my favorite things is, so like I have a, uh, just as an, as an example, I have a cabin in the woods. And, uh, they're like all kinds of cool wildlife on the property. And I don't get to see it because whenever I'm walking around, they're hiding. Uh, but I would love to know like what is out there. So, um, I just sent a cold email to this guy who works at national geographic and who sets up all of their camera traps to do wildlife photography. And so they're all like motion triggered. He, you know, sets up a camera in the woods. And then if an animal walks in front of the beam, it, you know, takes three shots or whatever. And so I sent him this email to try to convince him to come out to the property and teach me how do you do what you do and set up these, uh, you know, these remote triggered cameras and everything. And it took a couple of attempts, but eventually he was like, all right, fine. Like I'll, I'll come out and show you. And so he came out and it's so cool. And now I have four of those set up and we got <laughs> photos of, you know, bobcats and raccoons mm -hmm. and turkeys and all kinds of stuff. And, um, he told me, he was like, you know, when you first sent me that email, I kind of thought this guy's a little crazy. He doesn't really know what he's asking. You know, um, but he was like, once I talked to you, I was like, okay, fine. Like, you know, this will, yeah. this will be fine. And I use that kind of approach all the time in life. And the point that I'm getting at is I feel like most people just sort of assume that something like that is kind of out of reach. Yeah. That like, oh, I like, how would I even get in touch with a national geographic photographer? Like how, how would that even be possible? I wouldn't yeah. know what to do to take wildlife photos. And like, the truth is I had no idea what to do either but there are no rules. So I just emailed the person who does that thing and then yeah. see if I can convince them to come out and see what I can learn from them. Yeah. And if you take that kind of thinking and apply it to every area of life, you would be stunned what you can like come across and learn and build. Like there's so many cool things that you can interface with. Yeah. And it's just the courage and the willingness to reach out or initiate or send a cold email and, you know, kind of view it as like, there is no rule. It's just a story in your head that this is something that's hard to do. Like you yeah. just need to get over that little story and then there are all kinds of things open up. Yeah. Yeah. And I actually was curious about this and, and I'm going to come back to it because there's a, a question I had for you about um, kind of uh, how much like room to leave for those kinds of things mm. to oh, yeah. be explored. But, but I want to um, come back to the starting of jamesclear.com. Sure. Cause I, I am curious, you know, where that came from. Like, how did you all of a sudden decide 
this was going to be the thing that you were going to create. Yeah. And, you know, what I want to know is um, the habits piece, you know, where you landed, yeah. like how much of that was already in your life or did it come after yeah. you started it? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, okay. So I mentioned that kind of 18 month, two year period earlier on where I'm trying these different ideas. And part of that process, I, I tried a couple different blogs. I had one where I wrote about um, like freelancing tips or, you know, personal finance tips. Cause that was stuff that I was thinking about a lot at that time. Cause I was taking some freelance clients and stuff. Anyway, the point being, I wrote about a variety of topics and eventually I launched jamesclear.com and I was like, you know what, rather than trying to like build a brand, cause that's what I had been trying to do before was pick some business and build a brand. I'll just write about what I'm most interested in. And so I wrote about a bunch of stuff. I wrote about how to have better squat form in the gym. I wrote about the medical system in America. I wrote about, um, building better habits and being creative and productive. And eventually what ended up happening is there's like this Venn diagram overlap of things I'm interested in and then things the audience is interested in. And whenever I wrote about habits or strategy or decision-making or productivity, I got way better feedback from people. Mm. That was when people were like, Oh, this is kind of cool. Like what else do you have to say about that? And then the other stuff was kind of like, Oh, that's fine, but maybe keep it to yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it was just sort of, following my nose and getting a little bit about that feedback from the audience that made me realize, okay, I should focus here more. So that was one signal. The other signal, and I think this is true just for any habit that you're trying to build. I feel like a lot of the time when people build habits, they choose the habits that they kind of think they should have, or that like society encourages them to have, or their parents want them to have, or their peers want them to have. And what you really need to do is choose the version of a habit that is most genuinely exciting and interesting to you. You know, like the most common new year's resolution is some form of fitness, go to the gym, exercise more, whatever. I feel like a lot of people pick that just because they think they should go to the gym, you know, but my question is like, well, there are a lot of ways to live an active lifestyle. What is the form of exercise that is most genuinely interesting and exciting to you? You could rock climb or kayak or do yoga or lift weights or, you know, go for a run. Like there's so many different forms of an active lifestyle. You should choose the version of the habit that is most exciting to you. Another way to frame that question would be like, what would this look like if this was easy for me? What would this look like if this was fun for mm, me? Yeah. And you should choose the version of the habit that's the most fun. So what I'm getting to with the launch of jamesclear.com and writing about these different topics is I had this word document that I would, so I mentioned that internship that I had at the orthopedic practice. When I had like a free hour, I would just have that word document up in the background and I would just be like riffing and writing some thoughts down. And turns out that document ended up being like 60 pages long. And it was just a bunch of my notes. And a lot of it was about habits. A lot of it was about building better habits. I, I'm in the middle of grad school. I'm in the middle of, I have an internship. Like I'm not thinking about building a company on that, but I was already there naturally. Like it was just already a topic that I was curious about and interested in. And I think that was kind of a big signal where it was like, Hey, I bet your writing is better on that topic because people can sense the energy that you're putting into it. The fact that you're genuinely curious and interested in it. So I think those, those two signals, the audience liked it a little bit more and I was naturally engaged in it. Those were two of the main things that drove me to write about it. Makes sense. 